They fought Gaddafi. Now they're ready to fight the revolutionary government they replaced him with. And they've got the weapons to do it. Two years ago, Britain and other Western powers helped Libyan militias like this win freedom from tyranny. Now, Britain's being asked to help free the country from the militias themselves as they become the new tyrants. The oil that should flow from this and other terminals is Libya's main source of wealth. But the militia have shut the industry down. That's losing the country $130 million a day. But former rebel commanders refuse to return to civilian life. We were hoping to lay down our weapons and go home, but we realise that if we do that now, real revolutionaries like us will be killed on our doorsteps. The revolution has been stolen from us. Exports won't restart, the militia say, till the east of the country, Cyrenaica, which has most of the oil, is allowed to keep most of the revenue for itself. Their leader, a prisoner under Gaddafi, is holding the country to ransom. Our numbers are more than 20,000 and growing. People joining from various brigades, ex-army units, the police, the oil security force and border patrols. All we want is for everyone to have their fair share. If the government thinks of attacking Cyrenaica, it will lead to a real civil war. But we know they don't have the power to do that. Along the road from the terminal, the remains of the battle that saved eastern Libya for the rebels two years ago. Gaddafi's forces were smashed, first by French, then also by British missiles, as the dictator attempted a counter-offensive. In total, Britain spent £212 million on its air campaign in Libya. It seemed to many a triumph of liberal interventionism after the failure in Iraq. especially to David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy, welcomed as heroes in Benghazi, cradle of the revolution, in an outpouring of gratitude to the West, perhaps unprecedented in the Arab world. Your city was an inspiration to the world as you threw off a dictator and chose freedom. Now, Benghazi's so dangerous, no Western official will set foot here. Two years on from David Cameron's appearance here, it's clear that NATO missiles didn't only depose a dictator, they helped to destroy a state. Before, Libyans were terrified of the police. Now they're terrified by the lack of them. Gaddafi warned that he'd be replaced by tribalism, Islamic extremism and anarchy. And in large measure, he's been proved right. This police station is one of several in Benghazi that have been bombed repeatedly, the attackers unknown, and there are almost daily assassination attempts on military officers or public figures. And flying openly over parts of the city, the black flag of jihad. What we have here, we have a geographical region that is void of the presence of the state. This region is under the control of extremist radical movements that are either sympathetic or in full cooperation with Al-Qaeda. This suspected Al-Qaeda leader, Anas al-Libi, is now being interrogated on an American warship in the Mediterranean after being snatched by US Special Forces at the weekend from his car in the Libyan capital, Tripoli, where he was living openly. Intelligence agencies believe other Al-Qaeda leaders are building a logistical base in the east of the country for attacks throughout the region. And these are the kind of recyclable weapons they could easily get their hands on. This pile of ordnance, recovered from bombed Gaddafi bunkers in Misrata, has been secured by a British demining charity, but many similar sites with serviceable weapons have been taken over by militias or left open to looters. We have uh, this particular ammunition storage area here in Misrata. We've removed upwards of 35 tonnes of explosive content, which equates to probably 70,000 plus individual items of ordnance. So if you take Misrata as a, as a snapshot and you times that by 400, that gives you a, a bit of a, an estimate of how big the problem here really is. Libya is now thought to have the world's largest unsecured arms stockpile. 
Millions of tons of weapons are unaccounted for, including between three and 8,000 man-pad portable missile systems, which could bring down civilian airliners. Libyan arms are known to have been used in the terrorist attack on the Inamenas gas field in Algeria earlier this year. They fueled the attempt by Islamist militants to take over Mali, and they're now being used in the insurgency in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula and by rebels, including jihadis, in Syria. Even Libya's Prime Minister acknowledges the scale of the threat. Weapons are being smuggled from and into Libya by groups which are trying to murder people and spread terror. The movement of these weapons is also putting our neighboring countries at risk. We need international cooperation to stop it. Not all militia are extremists, these aren't. But there'll be no order until they're all forged into a national army. That's where Libya most needs foreign help. Hundreds of fighters will be sent for training to Britain and other countries later this year. But it'll be a slow process, partly because militias have supporters within the government. They're paid huge sums by the state, even when they oppose it. The extremist militias um, understood from the very beginning of the revolution that their main foe in the future would be a military institution. Thus, they chose to control the Ministry of Defense and the Prime Ministry and the Parliament for that matter in order to prevent the creation of a proper army that would serve the people and the interests of the people. Uh -huh. In this Benghazi home, a former rebel commander is keeping his weapons safe. His Islamist militia was driven off the streets by popular protest, but he thinks they'll be back. Right. So you keep these here all the time? Yeah. Sometimes you may get the impression that people hate the brigades, but that's not completely true. Now, a year on, there are people who are demanding our return. The Prime Minister admits his power is very limited. We are in a state of revolution, so we have no choice. The Libyan state has no control over the repercussions of the revolution because the state is weak. Now, with no end in sight to the oil blockade, the state's getting weaker by the day. America's raid on Tripoli may reflect a new estimation in Washington that the government can't turn the corner. A failing state could become a failed one. Look at Libya, President Assad of Syria said recently, for a lesson in the results of outside intervention in a civil war. He would say that, of course, but now there may be former interventionists who'd agree. <laughs>